Hi everyone, welcome to the webinar. Thank you so much for sharing some of your time today for joining today's webinar. Uh, in today's uh, today's panel, I have with me here James Higginbotham, who is an API consultant and also the founder of Launchen. Uh, James, uh, good morning to you. Hi, good good evening to you, and uh, thanks for having me here. Yeah. So just a note to everyone, uh, feel free to post your comments and queries uh, at any point during the course of this uh, webinar and presentation. So uh, I'm sure uh, James and I will get to you towards the end of the uh, webinar where we'll reserve a couple of minutes towards the end to answer your uh, comments and queries. Uh, yeah. So uh, James, uh, would you like to introduce yourself to our audience today? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, my name is James Higginbotham. I'm the founder of Launch Any. We are a boutique consulting company that uh, focuses on helping organizations to establish, grow, and mature their API programs. So we do everything from uh, live workshop training in the remote or, or on site, uh, as well as consulting to help uh, maybe unstick organizations that are kind of uh, stuck at a certain point in their API program journey, or just to help them get started if, if they're just, uh, just starting something formal. And they may already have APIs, but they're starting to formalize their program. So that's what we do. And we work with companies all over the world. That's fantastic. Uh, so for the audience, uh, just a bit a brief background on myself as uh, well. Uh, my name is Adib. I'm part of the platform engineering team here at API Wiz. Uh, prior to which I was working at Citibank uh, for close to three years in the uh, FX business unit, more specifically the FX options and risk management domains. Uh, yeah, that's just a short uh, introduction on myself. So uh, let's uh, let's dive in uh, dive into the topic at hand today, which is of course the uh, API linting and how we bring about API linting. Of course, also using uh, how we deal with API linting here on API Wiz as well. So uh, without further ado, uh, I possibly uh, I'll fire the first question away, James, to you. Was uh, you have definitely worked with a lot of organizations and different scales and capacities so in your experience uh, how do you uh, what's your take on some of the challenges with the ever-growing api portfolios that organizations are facing today yeah like what i mentioned uh, in my introduction there's a lot of organizations out there that are building apis today it's it's really an essential component of any organization that has any element of a, a, a digital front door or a digital face to their organization uh, they may be using APIs internally to power mobile and web apps. Uh, they may be using it to automate and integrate different areas of their business. Uh, but uh, oftentimes we see organizations starting to go outside the organization and open up APIs uh, to different partners in their supply chain or directly to their customers. So one of the challenges these organizations have is that they uh, oftentimes start their API program organically. And as they go, teams are starting to design and deliver APIs and they might be using um, different uh, standards, uh, different conventions. Uh, they may even just offer different ways to handle errors. And so you use one API from them and you know it works one way and I start to use another one and it works completely different. The naming conventions are different. Uh, you know, we can adapt to those things pretty easy as humans as we're writing that code and doing that integration work. But oftentimes the patterns and the error handling and the authorization uh, schemes change dramatically. I, I worked with a, a network device organization that uh, had a lot of acquisitions over time and every one of their products had a different authorization scheme. And so as a developer trying to work with their portfolio of devices and software solutions, it was very challenging. And so it pushed a lot of work back to the support teams of that organization to have to you know, handhold and guide the developers through the integration process. So these organizations are seeking consistency and looking to figure out how to establish some sort of standard and get their APIs moving toward that standard and get a little bit more uh, unification across their portfolio as they grow. So they may start off with just maybe a, a you know dozen, two dozen APIs, and eventually they start getting hundreds to thousands of APIs. And with that kind of inconsistency, it's very difficult to manage that portfolio and improve the developer experience of using those APIs. So they start going through the process of establishing an API style guide to create that consistency. Yeah, uh, that's exactly uh, exactly it. Uh, so when we're talking about consistency, you did mention uh, the use of API style guides. So would you want to elaborate a little bit on what these API style guides are and what they entail? 
Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so if, if anybody here um, watching this uh, webinar have been around for a while in the industry, they may have gone through the SOAR service oriented architecture days, the SOA days. And during that time, we saw a lot of organizations establish governance programs and things, and they were oftentimes very heavy handed. Um, they were uh, forcing teams to go in a specific direction down a specific path, and they very rarely could deviate from it. What we're seeing today with a lot of organizations is they're establishing style guides, and those capture many of the design decisions that these API producing teams will face. So as, as I need to stand up an API and do the design work for it, I need to start making some decisions. Anything, as I mentioned, from simple naming conventions, am I doing underscore lower camel case for properties? Uh, there might be different API media types that I'm going to choose. Am I just going to serialize JSON objects or am I going to use a hypermedia format? Uh, how am I going to handle errors? What response codes do I use in certain circumstances? And to drive all that, we want to have an API style guide that helps to deliver those decisions for teams. Now, oftentimes those style guides are not as strict as what we saw in the SOA days. They'll have a recommended path, something that they would say, here's your default decision, and then maybe one or two other options for those circumstances where that primary design decision doesn't make sense or doesn't fit the specific situation. Uh, what that does is it keeps the decision factors down for producing teams. So those teams are able to not spend a lot of time in analysis paralysis, having to go scour the web and look for, well, how's everybody else doing it? It gives them some basic guidelines to design their APIs and make them consistent and then have options when things don't quite fit the specific circumstances. So I see those captured sometimes in wikis, sometimes they're just in Markdown in a, in a Git repo, maybe hosted on GitHub or Bitbucket or something. Occasionally I'll see a PDF document export of it. Uh, but but oftentimes they're uh, something that's that's living and continually maintained, and there's probably a team that's stewarding it, or stewarding it, or a committee that's stewarding it, and it's just helping the organization um, reduce the amount of the micro decisions that any team has to make every day. We all have very busy schedules, and we want to get things done. So having some of those default decisions are great, and that helps to build consistency over time. It oftentimes takes time to get there, but uh, they it helps to 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 get that in place and then they complement that with with something like api linting to kind of create a, a way to check to see if your api design matches that style guide so james uh, when it comes to linting i'm sure there are uh, there are tons of uh, linting out there in terms of code and configuration but in the context of apis what would the linting in the context of apis involve Mm -hmm. uh, if you're a developer, you're probably already familiar with, with linting. It allows us to check to see if our code style is matching uh, the code style that's preferred by the organization so that when one team or one individual comes in and starts working on a code base that they haven't been involved with before, a lot of the different styles of how we edit and manage and, and design decisions and other things are, are kind of there. And we have these linting tools in the command line that can check and make sure that we're following those things and just kind of checking to make sure that we're not making any blatant mistakes. In the API world, API linting is kind of similar. What it does is it automates the process of, of all of your style guide rules. It verifies that you're complying against that style guide. So what most organizations are doing is they're growing that portfolio, is that they're, they're establishing a style guide, they have a committee around it, and then they have to take that style guide and they have to turn it into code, a set of rules that reflect exactly what that style guide has in it. And it may be rules that say this is an error and you cannot push this API design out without adhering to this particular rule, this convention that's established. There may be others that deliver warnings that say, you know, this is not preferred, but it might be that your API needs that. So those kind of optional rules we talked about earlier. So you're linting is a set of rules usually backed by some sort of code that will check your api design documents usually an open api specification or as some people uh, may still be referring to it as uh, swagger but uh, open api documentation and they're they're checking that and making sure that all of the design patterns and conventions and things are being adhered to so that avoids the need to have manual review because it's really hard to have on your screen a split screen with on one side, your style guide, on the other side, your design document and, and looking and trying to, to see if any infractions exist. So this is a way to kind of automate that process. 
Great. Uh, so James, uh, when it comes to linting, uh, how exactly does would the linting work in terms of the people coming new into linting? Uh, what would you say are one of the most uh, striking set of advantages that linting offers us? Yeah, uh, the, the automation and the consistency is really huge. And, and what it really does is allows us to um, have our, our style guide in place to uh, then turn that style guide into code and allow our developers to have these checks before our code goes out into production to say, is it matching everything that we expect? So we might have certain URL path rules that check to make sure that our paths are doing the right thing. We might have certain HP methods that we use or don't use. I know some organizations prefer maybe to use uh, put instead of patch or patch instead of put, and there's certain ones that they don't want to use. So they could write rules to check to make sure that certain HTTP methods aren't being used or certain HTTP response codes are being used. Uh, and it gives you a report back. So there's a huge advantage to being able to do that and uh, and to, to give that get that report back and say, okay, what did I miss? What did I misinterpret or forget to, to change to make sure I'm matching that style guide? So it gives me an automated way to to enforce my style guide and it keeps us from having to have teams of people manually reviewing APIs to make sure they adhere to it. So linting is a, is a huge part of, of an API design process and, uh, and that reporting is, is really necessary. And there's, there's a number of different tools that are out there. Um, I know Spectral is a pretty popular one. API Wiz, uh, you're gonna uh, show us how API Wiz's uh, linter works later on. And, uh, and that's really key uh, is to have some sort of tool adopted uh, to be able to to check your API design and, and make sure that it, that it all works out. I've even seen some organizations actually build their own tooling, which um, is unfortunate today. Uh, years ago, it might've been necessary. There weren't a lot of options out there. Uh, and so teams had to build their own. But I've, in that case, seen teams spend, um, you know, uh, years actually building and refining that linter and changing it and refactoring it. And, and it's a lot of work. It takes a lot of, of focused work. And, uh, and oftentimes there's just a handful of people that know how to maintain it. Um, now we're seeing these nice open source libraries and tools uh, like API Wiz and others uh, come out and offer capabilities of doing linting for us. And that makes a huge difference. So it's starting to meet those challenges that organizations are having as their portfolio grows. No, that's, that's perfectly, uh... Exactly it, uh, especially when it comes to the manual reviews and the time spent on uh, sort of enforcing your governance through a manual process. It leaves a lot of uh, room open to errors that can spontaneously uh, pop up anytime during your design process. So definitely uh, linting helps to automate that. Uh, so James, when it comes to, uh, let's say you did mention that a lot of uh, a lot of organizations did spend uh, time in uh, coding these linting rules manually. So would you say that there's a uh, inherent cost associated with coding them manually? Uh, there is, yeah. So so there's there's kind of two levels of cost. One is if you just build your own linter. Um, I just recently spoke with a client that's that's using, uh, you know, building their effectively a, a linter using Java and they're doing it from the ground up and it's kind of unfortunate. And hopefully they'll, they'll redirect um, once we make them aware of linting. Some, organizations are just not aware that there are some nice linting tools out there and they can focus on just building the rules and not have to build the whole engine and all that infrastructure. So that's one big cost. And, and, uh, and, and so that's one that you want to try to avoid if at all possible and adopt one of the, the existing linters. Uh, the other things that you oftentimes have to do is, is build the linting rules. So uh, some of the linters will come with some rules built in and you can leverage those and that gets you a jump start. But any time that those rules don't quite fit what you're looking for, you know, you have something custom, I need this particular field to exist if this other field exists or, or make sure it doesn't exist if I've got a mutually exclusive rule, one can exist but not the other. Um, sometimes those types of rules aren't built in. And so we have to spend some time coding them up. And that requires us to have someone who's familiar with, uh, you know, a, a programming language, like JavaScript or something, with whatever the rules need to be built in. And, uh, and then you have to allocate a team, stand them up, build their backlog of what's needed, start building those rules and deploying them. And uh, it gets very time consuming and costly. So you end up having dedicated teams just to do the work of checking to make sure your APIs are consistent. And 
you know, organizations are busy. We don't have time for that. Um, none of us have time to do that. We don't want to do the manual checks, and we also don't want to have to spin up development teams that are constantly having to maintain those rule sets. Um, and then, likewise, whenever we have organizations uh, that have linting in place, oftentimes it's difficult for the developers to get that into their IDE. They may not have the right tools because there's custom uh, code, the custom rules that have to be run, and they're not sure how to get them up and running. And so maybe they're running an old version, outdated version, or or they're just not able to get the environment set up. So they're, they're unable to kind of do, check their linting as they're going. Uh, so there's a lot of cost to it. And so we have to factor those things in as part of our API program. Uh, that's why I really recommend uh, adopting linters that are off the shelf. So you don't have to be in the job of building your own linter uh, and hopefully building or finding a linter that keeps you from having to write uh, very little, if any, code at all. And for the audience, uh, James, uh, uh, would you uh, have any sort of real-world examples where this cost of linting has proven detrimental in the longer run? Yeah, I've, I've got a couple of them that are kind of, you know, examples of what we just talked about. One is a, is a North American um, financial institution. They're a, they're a bank that's across North America, and uh, they they're one of them that I was mentioning before that built their own linter. Now. You, you have to understand they built their linter at a time when there were not tools out there to do that. There wasn't a choice for them. But now what they've seen is they, they've over the years seen the cost it takes to maintain it. And, and it you know, took them about three months to get that initial linter built up, but they spent uh, dedicated resources they assigned to this over four years that were just strictly assigned to managing the linting rules. And when new rules were introduced because the style guide needed to be adjusted, they would have to be you know, given a backlog item to go and make changes to that linter. And there were maybe two or three people that knew how that linter worked. Over time, two of those three people left and eventually the third person left. And so there was now this knowledge transfer that had to occur. So we eventually realized in, in their environment that they needed to stop, reassess, and start to adopt uh, the off-the-shelf solution. So they started using one of the open source linting tools. And um, that was really important for them. They uh, were able to kind of do away with having to understand the core engine and could focus on building out all the rules and understanding from there what, uh, you know, what rules need to be implemented, what rules maybe were outdated, and get that integrated. So they lost a lot of their knowledge from the original. They lost a lot of capabilities um, that they had originally. They had to kind of rebuild those. So today, because we have these tools available, I really highly advise to, to avoid that. Uh, but it was definitely something that was necessary at the time. Uh, but I think they, you know, they, they did get behind too. Another thing to keep in mind is their linter was only written for open API spec version two or swagger. It was still known at that time. And then as it became open API spec version two and then three, they had no rules for three and no one knew how to add version three rules to that homemade linter. So moving to an open source linter gained them the ability to start linting against multiple versions right out of the box. They didn't have to wait. That was huge. Um, another example was a commercial insurance organization. They adopted one of these open source tools uh, immediately. But what they found was a lot of the out of the box rules just didn't work for them. So they did have to spend a lot of time coding up their own linting rules and automating their style guide decisions. They didn't want their style guide to be influenced by what kind of hand coding needed to be done for those linting rules. So they had to kind of make that trade off and spend a time and dedicate a team for two months to build out all the rules to automate in that time that it took because it took they had to spin up the team, you know, get approval, get a budget get the team allocated, get the backlog filled, make sure everybody's all in alignment and then start working through iterations of the linting rules. Uh, it took them quite a bit of time. Uh, and during that time, they had to do a lot of manual design reviews using the style guide and, and, and a federated coach program that we helped them set stand up. So there was some, some downside to that. Of course, they accelerated their process compared to the bank that I had mentioned. They didn't have to write their own linter, but they also did have to dive in and start spending a lot of time writing code to get their linting rules up and running. So that took a little time and caused a lot of manual processes to occur. 
Yeah, that's certainly a challenge, uh, especially coding it manually and uh, the scalability and adaptability certainly becomes a challenge, especially when you have uh, new versions of the open API coming out. Uh, yeah, that definitely does pose a certain uh, threat to manually coded linting environments. Uh, so James, uh, when it comes to the avenue in API linting, would you say uh, there's a stopgap at custom development or is there something beyond that? What I've seen for a lot of organizations that um, uh, are much larger, they're, they're probably, they have you know tens to hundreds of APIs and they're really targeting producing thousands of APIs at some point is that they have to manage the organization-wide adoption of the linter and their style guide. You can not just build a style guide, build the linting rules, and then one day mandate, guess what? Your whole team now gets to use this style guide. And oh, by the way, if you have an existing API, you're gonna have to break all your consumers to abide by the style guide. That's not an option, we can't do that. Uh, reality says that we're gonna have APIs that don't follow the style guide decisions and won't pass the linter. So then they have to spend time trying to understand how to migrate these APIs uh, over to the style guide. And then they usually have something um, like an um, embrace and extend approach. They contribute to and provide feedback to the style guide of here's what makes the most sense and here's where we can agree that, you know, this, this, these style guide decisions and, uh, and rules make sense for all of us. But we also have to recognize that our API is not going to get there. So we have to uh, extend the style guide and override it sometimes and use local rules to make sure that we can use a linter, check our API style, but override the rules that we can adhere by because our API has been around longer than the style guide. And so now we have to have even more work and even more complications to try to figure out how do I allow teams to override the style guide and the linting rules without requiring them to re-implement all the linting rules from scratch. And so teams will spend time trying to troubleshoot that and figure that out. Um, one example that I saw of that was uh, uh, that same network device manufacturer I mentioned earlier, because they had a lot of products, hardware and software, that were acquired over a number of years, every one of the products had a different authorization scheme, had different API design styles, some of them used remote procedure calls, RPC, some use more REST style, uh, some were newer and using gRPC and, and uh, uh, you know, other, other styles of, of APIs. And so there was this huge mixture. And so you couldn't just go to the team and say, here's your style guide. Next time you build an API, this is what you have to adhere to. We actually had to have workshops, we had to fly people into their, one of their uh, locations, have multiple workshops, discuss each of the different elements of the style guide, work through that and then manually track uh, their progress. So that was one of the other things that we really struggle with as well, is just tracking that level of adoption. So James, uh, you did mention the interesting point where organizations have to spend some effort on tracking this adoption. So how do you feel it's being handled today and do you uh, think there's a real scope for improvement in how it's being tracked? Yeah, it's, it's really hard. I mean, uh, you, you can try to take some of the reports from your CICD processes and assuming that you have pipelines set up for each of the different APIs, you can try to, you know, aggregate those reports and figure that out. Uh, but it's difficult. And if some organizations are not using the same pipeline, uh, delivery pipelines that other parts of the organization are, then that becomes even more difficult. So what we had to do for that network device manufacturer is we actually had to have a spreadsheet and manually go to each team and ask one of the product owners or tech leads to look at the style, the spreadsheet and fill it out on a quarterly, you know, semi-annually basis. And that allowed us to understand where they're at and it allowed us to, uh, you know, know which rules are they using, which rules they aren't. So what we had to do is effectively take the API style guide turn it into a spreadsheet with rows for each of the must shoulds and mays using you know our RFC 2119 style that we crafted it in and then send that spreadsheet out and aggregate all the results and then turn that into a report so that the teams that are managing the API program can report back up and say this is how far we progressed in the last quarter in the last six months in the last 12 months with the adoption of our style guide and how we're starting to come together as an organization uh, and that's a lot of manual work. I mean, you have to spend a lot of time gathering all that information up and it's not easy. And you can try to automate it, like I said, by parsing uh, 
deployment pipeline logs and other things, but that's not always possible. So you have to drop to a manual approach. So um, that's really uh, where I was impressed as I was looking in API Wiz is, uh, you know, there's there's some different linting solutions out there and everybody can, can use what they need and, and they're hopefully getting the value that we've talked about so far as they're starting to scale their API program. But API Wiz really has, uh, to me, two key differentiators. It allows you to build rules without having to write code and it allows you to have multi-level linting rules to get those reports out and to be able to do that at design time and not at deploy time. So you're not making a team go through and do a bunch of design. They write a bunch of code to that design. And then at the last mile, they realize, oh, we broke something and somebody's not gonna approve something. Some governance team that I've never met before just said, this isn't approved, this is wrong because it didn't abide by the style, uh, style guide. So being able to have that linting and have it there when I'm doing the design, and then as someone in the program being able to have reports of which rules are being used where uh, and allowing me to figure out how is the adoption going what teams are overriding certain rules how how are things going that that was that's really huge and and it solves a lot of problems in these api programs that are starting to scale out um, a lot of the organizations that i work with have hundreds and most have thousands of apis i have one client that i work with that has about five to six thousand apis uh, less than 6,000, more than 5,000, and it grows every day. You cannot scale a program like that with manual reviews and manual spreadsheets and everything else to make sure people are adopting. It just takes too much time and too much resource and too much, uh, you know, too much money, too much cost to to make it all happen. So, uh, so uh, you know, API Wiz's uh, opportunities here uh, to meet those needs is is tremendous. Yeah. Uh so I feel this is a good opportunity to showcase the API Wiz platform and how we handle linting at API Wiz. So what I will do is I will switch over to the linting dashboard view that's available on API Wiz. Uh, and what I'll also do is I will switch off my webcam so we have a better viewing experience for the audience. I'll do the same. Yeah. So hey everyone from the audience, uh, uh, now that we've seen a couple of our conversation with uh, James and how uh, linting is and how what are the steps involved in linting and how linting is being handled today, uh, I'm going to show you a quick demo of how we do things on API Wiz when it comes to API linting. So uh, this is the uh, this is the uh, API linting dashboard that we see on API Wiz. So one thing to note here is that uh, in this particular design time governance, you will see the charts and visualizations. You'll also see the uh, runs that are available for each linting rule set. And on the right side, you'll see a panel of violations that have occurred depending on the rule sets that you have configured. So over here, I see the the first violation on Acme Bank transactions uh, API is. I have a couple of violations that have occurred. So some of the uh, some of the things that you can do on the linting dashboard is uh, for each violation you can actually drill down into that error and see what is the line that's actually causing the error, right? So I can can click on this particular arrow on the right hand side and it'll actually take me to that point uh, within the Open API spec that actually caused that error. So over here I see that. Uh, my rule is exactly saying that I need the operation ID to be present in kebab case, but in fact, this is a camel case. So that's why it's highlighting it as an error. And that's why it's uh, available on the violations panel here on the right. So when it comes to API linting, really the uh, the advantages, some of which uh, some of which James had also covered earlier, was to have an active integrated approach to design time governance that goes hand in hand with your design process. You don't want to sort of do it once and hook it to your CI CD and have it run once, once you're done building your API. You want to have it actively run every time you make a change in your API or every time you make a change in your data models. So that's something that API Wiz allows you to do. So every time you make a change in your open API spec or even your data models present in your schema registry, uh, we do run the, the linting present on those specs or data dictionary, depending on which you have tagged that particular rule set to. And that gets automat automatically run every time you make changes. So what I'll do now is I'll head over to the rule set section to show how we can configure rule sets on API Wiz. So this is view rule sets button. 
once we click it, it leads us to the rule set screen. So here you will notice two distinctions available. That is your global rule sets and other rule sets. So when I say global rule set, I mean a rule set that applies to all the all the designs of a particular type, it could be in OS 2.0 or 3.0, and the other rule sets are more domain specific or API specific rule sets. So if I configure something as a custom rule set, it's gonna apply only to a specific subdomain or to a specific set of APIs. So let's let's build a particular linting scenario from scratch and let's uh, iteratively expand that linting scenario to cover more and more scenarios, right? So let's see how we can create a linting rule set. We have to click on this add rule set button on the top right hand corner of your screen. And as soon as you click on the add rule set, you're given with a pop-up model. And this model gives you a couple of options, right? You can select what is the type of rule set that you want to configure. It can either be a OS 2.0 or 3.0 or a data dictionary as well. Or we give you an option to import one of our existing rule set templates. And that's something that you can do. If you select the rule set template, we have a pre-configured set of over 200 rule sets for both OS 2.0 and 3.0. And that's something that you can make use of, which captures the industrial best practices uh, when it comes to your APIs. And of course, we also have an option to upload an external style guide, which comes from uh, say Spectral, for example. So that's, uh, that's something that we will cover towards the end of the webinar. So for now, I'm gonna click on blank rule set because I wanna build this linting scenario from scratch. So I'm gonna click on blank rule set. I'm gonna give it a name. So I'm gonna give it linting scenarios and I'm gonna give it a description that says base scenarios for linting. So here's where you give, uh, you're given an option. You can either uh, specify this as a custom rule set which applies to a specific subdomain or a specific set of APIs or we give you an option to check, uh, check mark this box here which says make global rule set. As soon as you click on this make global rule set, it's going to create this as a global rule set, which will get triggered automatically whenever you uh, make changes across your APIs. And it runs globally for all rule sets in this particular case across the OS 2.0. So let me click on add. And now I've created a blank rule set. So to start out with my linting scenario, let's say that I want to choose uh, one particular API. And I want to start, uh, say, let's say for the first scenario, I want to specify a couple of mandatory headers that has to be present. So for my open API, uh, before uh, heading into uh, the more uh, intricate details of the linting, just to give a short context on uh, what API this supports, we do have a, a design studio and a data dictionary, uh, which helps you to easily create uh, APIs and start working with API designs for both the technical and non-technical stakeholders. So just to give you a short glimpse of that, in terms of the design studio, I have a particular set of APIs that's available and you can see that the linting is automatically integrated with each one of them. So let me choose this particular uh, open API spec and say that I wanna view it. So just to give an idea of what's the open API that I'm gonna be working with, you can see that there are two uh, controls over here and I have a couple of resources over here and this particular API references uh, a couple of shared parameters and a, part of, a couple of set of data models as well. So quickly switching back to the linting, and of course, even the data dictionary that we have on API Wiz covers a certain set of uh, models that you can define in the central schema registry, which helps to promote your reusability and consistency across your APIs. You can easily create your data models as well on API Wiz. Of course, I uh, wouldn't want to dive too deep into these uh, concepts, but just to note that it is uh, important to sort of yeah, get a little context into these before we dive into linting. Hey, hey Deep. So, uh, with the data models, is that does that mean what I can do is create like a shared address or something like that of how I represent a, a physical mailing postal address and share that across APIs? Is that what that's for? Yes, that's right. So the same okay. data model can be shared across the APIs. So it will be consistently referenced across your APIs. That's right. Okay, great. So just switching back to the uh, linting dashboard where we come into our linting rule set. So uh, let's cover some of the other features that our linting studio provides you with. So I have a couple of a uh, couple of pre-built scenarios over here. So I'm gonna start with the mandatory header scenario that I've uh, of course pre-built in the interest of time. So what I can do is click on this and click on edit. 
So whenever you open a particular linting rule set in the edit mode, it gives you a two panel view wherein you can cover what your linting rule set description is. And of course, the information on the right gives you uh, editable fields for what its name is and what's the severity level that you want to tag it to. It can either be an uh, error or warning or an info field. So as soon as this particular violation occurs, it will be flagged as say, uh, an error or warning or info depending on what severity level that you've tagged it in. For example, in these particular headers, I've, say, I've said that the I want the XPIN ACME, the XPIN REST, and of course the authorization header to be uh, present, and these are in fact mandatory for my API. So what I'm going to do is I created a uh, linting scenarios, uh, base linting scenarios rule set earlier, which is currently empty. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy these scenarios over to that rule set which is why we have a dedicated copy functionality over here. So I can click on this copy rule and I can select what is that rule set that I wanna copy this rule into. And of course, if there's any other rule set that has this particular uh, configuration already configured in it, it'll, it's gonna give you a warning saying that, hey, this rule set is already configured in this particular rule set. So I'm gonna select the lending scenarios. That's the one that I just created. And I'm gonna click on copy. So once I click on that, the rule set is successfully copied. So I'm going to do the same with these other two rule sets as well. So I'm going to copy these two rules using the copy button. And let's switch back to that particular rule that I just now created. So is this, is this allowing us to uh, have a team to say, okay, I'm going to pull in these linting rules that uh, that are part of the style guide and then, uh, but I have to create a, a few new rules because our team uses something slightly different. Is that is that what we're doing here? Yes, that's right. We give you the okay. custom uh, customization and the flexibility to sort of pick and choose or cherry pick the rules that you want to transfer over to a customized linting rule set. So that helps oh. with a little flexibility. Yeah. Okay, great, great, great. So what I'll do now is I'll trigger this particular linting rule set and of course, let's select the same API that we saw earlier. And we give you the provision of selecting what is that particular revision of the API that you want to run this linting on. The same API could have multiple revisions. So you can, you can explicitly select what is that revision of the API that you want to select. Or if you just select the main home uh, checkbox over here, it's going to apply to all the revisions of this particular API. And you can go ahead and click on this run. And as soon as this uh, linting is successfully triggered and the linting is complete, you'd be able to see the linting results present in the dashboard. So if you were to go back into the linting dashboard, I see over here that the new linting uh, scenario that I ran for these mandatory headers, it says that this uh, has been flagged as an error saying that these headers are in fact mandatory, but it's not the case in my particular API. And if I would actually drill down into my API, Let's say I want to open this in the editor mode. And if I scroll down to that particular fields, I'd be able to see why it was flagged as an error. And in fact, I do see that the exponacme required is false and authorization is also false. So that's exactly why it's been flagged as an error here, depending on the uh, linting rule that I've configured over here. So now we've seen how we can actually uh, create our own custom rule sets and we can copy our rules from one rule set to another. So let's build on the same, uh, the same linting scenario and let's add a couple more uh, linting rules to this particular linting scenario. Moving back to the rule set and I was working with the linting scenarios. So let's add another rule where I say that I want my operation IDs to be, uh, I want my operation IDs to be kebab case, for example. And I've pre-built uh, a particular rule set for that. So what I can do is I can open this in edit and let me copy it over to my linting scenarios base rules. And of course, once it's copied, I can switch back to my linting scenarios and I can trigger this as a rule. So one thing I do want to uh, also note here is that each of these rules, you can uh, explicitly tag the severity level, right? For example, these top three headers, mandatory headers were tagged as an error. If you wanted to change the severity level of this particular rule, you can easily just click on this and say that you want to tag it as a warning instead of an error. And you can go ahead and click save. Let me trigger the same rule set on this particular API. 
And of course, once the linting is successfully triggered and the linting is completed, you can see the uh, results available on the linting dashboard. So I see over here that I have three headers, which is the same uh, three mandatory headers uh, issue that we saw earlier. And now we have a new set of uh, violations, which comes under warning, which tells me that my uh, I have a couple of APIs uh, and operation IDs that are not kebab case. For example, if I were to open this particular violation, it does tell me that this is not in kebab case. In fact, it's following a camel case convention. So uh, Right, so this linting is working and it's it's correctly configured. So now that we've built on this linting scenario and added the operation ID, let's go back and uh, add a few more scenarios to our base set of scenarios. Let's say this time that I want my API to only have a, a scheme of HTTPS, and that's something I can also configure in my linting scenario, wherein I can just choose, I can configure a particular HTTPS scenario, say that this is the particular rule that I want, and let me just add this quickly to my linting scenarios. And now let me switch back to the linting scenarios and let's trigger this particular scenario on the same API again. Yep, uh, the linting is successfully triggered and the results uh, should now be available on the linting dashboard once it's uh, completed. So now you do see in addition to the 10 kebab case warnings, there's also an additional warning, which is of course the uh, HTTPS protocol that has to be followed. Over here I see that within my API, I have a scheme of HTTP, which is why this has been flagged as an error. So let's build on this particular linting scenario. And now that I've configured the mandatory headers, I've configured the operation ID, I've configured the scheme. Let's say that I want to also uh, configure a rule for the semantic versioning of this uh, particular API. For that, let me say for semantic versioning, I have a, another custom rule set from which I can just uh, plug in the rules. So I can choose this particular semantic versioning rule from this rule set and let me copy it over to the linting scenarios and quickly switching back to the linting scenarios. Let's trigger it on the same, uh, same API. Let's click on run and we see that the linting is in fact run successfully and the results will again be available on the dashboard. So every time you run the linting rule set, uh, it'll take a couple of seconds, but the results will be available on the uh, linting dashboard. And over here, I see that that error successfully uh, not been flagged as a violation. So in fact, my API is compliant with that particular uh, rule set. So let's uh, define another linting scenario now. I've done my semantic versioning of my API and I've done my operation ID, I've done my mandatory headers, and if I want to add another uh, rule set, for example, let's say the info title has to be present within my particular API, I can do that as well. So one thing to note here is that uh, all the rules are completely GUI driven, right? So you don't have to specifically code, uh, sort of create any code for creating your rule set over here. All you have to do is have a, uh, have a good understanding of the JSON path notation. That's, where, how, that's how you specify what is the element that you want validated against. And we have a couple of different rule types. We have an assert and a regex based rule type. In terms of assert, you can do several of the assertions in terms of the conditions that you want to evaluate. And in terms of regex, you can have a match or non-match and you can give your regex expression over here to of course validate that same rule. So now that we've in fact built this linting scenario and we've run it against this particular open API, let's also, uh, let's also do the same for let's say a data model now. 
going back to the rule set earlier we had created this uh, lending scenarios for the OS 2.0 now I do want to mention that uh, I've taken OS 2.0 as an example but the same could easily just as well apply to OS 3.0 as well we do support both the OS 2.0 and 3.0 version as well so that's something that can easily be uh, used within our API with lending studio so now that's, that we've seen yeah. Sorry, I was just going to jump in and say that I, that's that's a really important thing to note because I've worked with organizations that still have quite a few APIs in OAS 2, 2.0. So it's uh, being able to do 2 and 3 is is important for a lot. They're trying to migrate new APIs are under 3, older APIs are under 2. They don't want to have to mass convert the 2s to 3 yet. So being able to implement both is, is, uh, is a huge win. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so now what I'll do is I'm going to create a, a linting scenario and I'm going to create one for a data dictionary this time and choose a specific data model to apply those particular linting rules to. So I have a, a pre-built scenario that's uh, built out as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this particular linting rule for a data, data dictionary and click on the edit view over here. So you'll see that the same can be applied even to the data models that we have present in our schema registry. In this particular view, I want to say a particular make a checker governance is present on all my data models. So which is why I require a couple of mandatory fields such as the created by, the modified by, and I also have a few other fields such as the creation timestamp, the modification timestamp, and of course a few other fields as well, which is mandatory for the data models. And if I wanted to run this particular rule set against a uh, data dictionary and data model in particular I have to just click on this run rule set and I can choose what is that particular data dictionary that I can select and what is that specific uh, data model that I can select to run this particular uh, rule set against for example if I were to choose this particular API and choose this particular revision I can choose what is that particular data model within the data dictionary that I can actually choose this linting to run against and I can click on the run and the same, uh, the linting rule would be successfully triggered and the results would of course be present in the dashboard. And the violations as we've seen earlier would be flagged as and when, uh, depending on how you've configured the severity levels. So I feel now is a, uh, Now's a good time to uh, sort of take a pause. And also, uh, I did mention towards uh, towards the beginning of the uh, uh, beginning of the demo that we will also be uh, sort of accommodating your existing external style guides as well. So, what I also want to do is show you an example of how you can sort of import your existing, uh, let's say, spectral rule set into API Wiz and start uh, start using those to uh, run these linting rules as well. So let me click on add rule set. And we have an option here to browse and select your external style guide. So I'm gonna click on this browse. I'm gonna select my external style guide and I'm gonna click on this preview button over here. So this gives me the same uh, look and feel of how my linting rules are look like and you can configure how these rules should uh, be. You can make any ad hoc changes after you're done importing them and you can go ahead and click on this import button over here. I've already pre-imported this external rule set which is available in my view rule sets panel over here as in the external style guide. So, and the same rule applies even to your external style guides. There's no, uh, there's no difference. All I have to do is click on this run and you have to choose what is that API that you want to run this against and you can go ahead and click on run. So the same, uh, the same would be available present within your dashboard in terms of results. So the important thing to note here is that uh, your external style guide doesn't change how you process the linting rules on API Wiz. Once it's imported, you get to manage it, you get to handle it, you get to make edits on it, you get to clone it or copy it the same way as you do with the other rule sets. So that's something uh, important to note over here. So that's, uh, that's the crux of the matter. Right, so now we have uh, covered a good chunk of how we do linting here on API Wiz. So uh, probably I will uh, I'll switch uh, switch it over back to James and uh, probably we can uh, to a, 
I see that it's almost the top of the hour. Perhaps we can have a quick question and then shift to any Q&A if we have some uh, queries present in the chat. So, uh, so James, uh, how do you saw, uh, how do others incorporate linting on their day-to-day -day workflows today? Yeah, I, that, that's kind of the difficulty that I've seen with a lot of organizations is uh, the developers are oftentimes have to be told, here is the repository where all the linting rules are at. They have to clone that repository and get the linter set up on their own uh, environment, on their laptop, and uh, start to be able to use that. And that's really, really challenging. Uh, to do sometimes uh, if it's just a single set of rules and you're starting off and you're smaller you know kind of startup or you you're you're just starting your api program you can probably get away with that but as your uh, program grows and certain teams are adopting different uh, technologies their laptops may not be set up to be able to run the linter they may not be comfortable getting those environments set up and um, it becomes a lot more challenging to get that feedback when you're developing so if i'm working in my ide i can use a plugin to run those linters inside my IDE, but now I have to make sure I have all those custom rules and I have to make sure that I'm in sync with those custom rules. And if they introduce new rules or make a change, I might be running outdated rules. And so I might get a false sense of security. My everything passed and I push it in and it starts failing in my delivery pipeline. So um, that's one of the biggest sticking points that I've found. And so uh, I've seen some organizations, I saw one recently that had built like a little web interface and you can copy and paste your, your open API spec in there and it'll run against the rules and give you feedback. And so you can kind of use that tool to get feedback, but that's outside of your development flow. So what's exciting to me about this and what kind of, uh, kind of piqued my interest a lot about the linting capability in API Wiz is, is exactly that. It's the idea that I can be editing my open API specs inside of API Wiz uh, I can pull in data dictionaries or data models, reusable schema definitions that I can pull into my API so that I'm designing a consistent API and I don't have to redo everything over and over again. Every time there's an error structure that I need to put into my open API spec, I can just grab that error structure, shared data model, bring that in. I don't have to worry about it. And, uh, and all of it's being linted and giving me feedback uh, quickly as I'm designing. So I'm not waiting uh, for, for some later pipeline to give me an email to tell me something was wrong or to try to figure out how to get this thing up and running on my own environment i don't have to do anything i go in there and i do it and uh and i can from the api program side have the confidence to know that all my apis uh are, are passing the the linting rules that i've established or i can get reports to know which ones aren't being run or being overridden by specific teams because they're not quite ready to adopt yet so uh, this is really something that's designed for a, a, a group that um, uh, or an organization that's really growing, has lots of teams, and you're not going to be able to just get away with this with one or two people kind of doing this manually. Yeah, that's uh, that's great, uh, James. So what I'll also do now is I also want to show uh, something really important in when it comes to uh, linting on API Wiz, that is how do we uh, set these automation guidelines and how do we actually automate the uh, linting process for our rules as well, for our designs, as well as for the data models. So Great. just quickly looking back to the uh, linting dashboard. So earlier, how we saw we were triggering the linting rules was to actually go into our rule set and uh, sort of click on the run, uh, the run button uh, manually. But what we can also do is select the linting scenario that you want automated to automatically run every time a change is made uh, inside your API design or your data model. And we have on the top right corner of your screen, we have a assign button. So you can click on that and you can choose which API you want to assign this particular rule set to. Now, if it's a custom rule set, you can assign it to a specific subset of APIs. Or if it's a global rule set, it's going to apply to every uh, every design in that particular type. It could be 2.0 or 3.0. So let's say that I want to automate this particular rule set for the transactions LNC design. I'm going to click on Assign. And now I see that it has been assigned to this particular rule set. So now what I'm going to do is uh, I can actually go and change the stats of my particular API. right? So I can go ahead and make a change in this particular API. and What's going to happen is the not just the global rule set, but any custom rule sets that have been assigned to your design or your data model, that's going to get triggered. 
So this really helps in automating the linting process, which essentially becomes an integrated part of your API design process. So let me go ahead and click on this status and let me change it to review and needs review. Now let me go ahead and click on submit. So now I've changed the status of this particular API design. And of course the linting is gonna get automatically triggered as well. So it's gonna take a couple of seconds, but it's also gonna appear on your dashboard. So that really helps in automating the uh, linting design, uh, linting design time governance process. And the key idea here is to sort of never let any commit go untracked because that could be like a missed opportunity when it comes to capturing, uh, uh, capturing your design time governance gaps right at the design stage. So that's a crucial component when it comes to uh, design time governance and of course uh, linting as we have it. So this is, uh, this is how we can automate, uh, we can automate the process of uh, API linting on API Wiz. So yeah, that's that's huge. That's huge for a lot of organizations. Um, I haven't seen any code written. Uh, I've only seen just some JSON pads that have been composed. So now I haven't had to, uh, you know, build a team up, build custom rules, understand to get them running, uh, and then I, as the designer, can get immediate feedback. And as the the program manager for the APIs, I can ensure that all my APIs are being checked and the people are being aware of, oh, you're deviating from the standards and they're getting reported early rather than too late when it's too costly or too late to make that change. And now we have inconsistencies across our portfolio. So this is this is a, a, a huge improve, improvement to the workflow of any API designer and uh, provider team for sure. Yeah. Thanks so much, James, for joining today. Uh, I think we're at the top of the hour, but I'm sure uh, we have covered quite a bit in uh, in terms of content when it comes to API linting and how we can uh, automate those processes. So I feel uh, it's it's a good stop over here. Sounds great. Yeah, and if anybody has any follow-up questions, if they didn't get their question answered here because we ran out of time, uh, where can they go to to contact you? Do this go to your website? Yes, that's right. So I'll post the uh, contact email in the chat as well. You can uh, contact us with any queries or uh, queries or comments on the what you saw today, and you can send it over to info at apiwiz.com. Great. And they can sign up for a trial of the product as well. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Okay, great. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks a lot for having me. I appreciate it. This was really eye-opening to see what could be done. Uh, with API Wiz and, and uh, you know, we did a lot in a very short period of time and didn't even have to write any code to do it. So that was fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, James. Thanks all.